Hello, we're so glad you're here. Starting live at the library a little early today. Um, I'm Clay Smith, I'm the literary director here at the Library of Congress. And of course, I bet you all know who these two are. Katrin Jakobs Dotir is the Prime Minister of Iceland. She has been in that role since 2017. And Ragnar Jonasson is um, a number one international best-selling writer who, um, whose work is sold in 36 countries. And uh, this is their first collaboration, Katrin's debut novel. Not her debut book, though. So, um, so we're going to talk for a little while. We're going to open it up to questions from you all. And when we do, uh, a staff member from the library will be walking around uh, with a microphone, and uh, you can ask your questions. So let's just start. First of all, uh, we're not so used in America to our presidents writing crime fiction. I mean, you know, I mean, Hillary Clinton did it with um, Louise Penny, uh, who is actually, for you, you crime fiction fans, Louise Penny is coming here on October 26th, uh, and tickets for that event will start being available on September 26th. But as I was saying, in America, we're not used to our presidents writing crime fiction. How, how did you two um, get together and first think about writing this novel together? Well, very happy to be here. And well, maybe just one point that in Iceland, people are very used to nearly everybody writing books. <laughs> you know, our president has recently published uh, a, a book on history because he's an academic, a historian. Uh, an earlier prime minister actually published uh, a book that became a bestseller, right? So, so this is not quite an uncommon event in Iceland, and that's maybe because we all think that we can write. So, <laughs> so sometimes it's said that every Icelander publishes at least one book. Maybe that's maybe an exaggeration. But uh, we have known each other for some time. Uh, we. Uh, I used to write about crime fiction uh, as a literary theorist. I wrote a critic. I worked for a publishing house. So, so we have known each other from the crime literature scene, if I may say so, in Iceland. What was your thesis um, specifically about? Um, first, I wrote uh, a thesis really about the history of Icelandic crime fiction, which actually started in late 19th century. The first Icelandic, uh, well, the first Icelandic crime novel came out early 20th century. It was called an Icelandic Sherlock Holmes. Uh, but we began translating in the light, late 19th century. And then I wrote uh, a thesis on Arnaldur Indriðason, who is also very widely published. And so, Ragnar, have you, have you collaborated with many other writers on, on a novel before? No, I, <coughs> actually, this was my, my first collaboration uh, uh, for a novel. I did a short story once with a friend of mine who is a pianist, and, and that was a very different type of undertaking. But uh, no, uh, and I've been writing books for maybe for more than 10 years now, and writing can be a lonely profession. <laughs> so for me, it was both a pleasure and, uh, and uh, just a change of... of pays to do do this with someone else and um, you know both in the in terms of writing the creative process uh, the editing the pub and you know the promotion and sitting here you know together it's something different from what I'm used to mm -hmm. so it was never a uh, it was always I always looked at this very optimistically and 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 so it was me who brought this idea to Katrin although we had discussed for quite a few years that see you know so maybe we do a book together or uh, there was obviously an interest in on her uh, uh, from her to do a crime novel at some point because yeah. that's what she reads and, and what she's written about mm -hmm. so but somehow this all came together in uh, two years ago when we when we thought of uh, thought you know this had a had lunch and decided to do a book well it was early year 2020 Okay. And he actually said, because we had often talked about it, you know, maybe we should write together, yeah, and then nothing happened. Mm -hmm. But he had this idea that a girl went missing in Vide, which is an island close to Reykjavik. And I said, yeah, let's do it. And I thought, I'm not going to keep that promise. I <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so I was said, yeah, yeah, let's do it. And then the pandemic hit us, and obviously I was absolutely absorbed for a few months. But then... 
because the pandemic really changed the tune of time really for all of us. So actually, instead of lying awake in the evenings and worrying, I said to myself, maybe we should start this. And actually, Ragnar put on an extra pressure there. Yes. I So so what happened in the... In the uh a few months after we had this lunch, we were on national television in Iceland. There was this Friday night talk show that everyone watches, and by 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 chance we were there together. Mm. And so I announced this on national television. Where <laughs> <laughs> so then there was no turning back. Yep. And actually, that's that's a plot point in in this novel. So <laughs> <laughs> you know, life fiction reflects life. So Ragnar, you you are also an investment banker, and you are a professor. And obviously, you are also a prime minister <laughs> in addition to being a writer. What, I mean, I know that it was the pandemic, but but talk to us about the time. Like, did, did, how did you find time during the day? Would one of you write a chapter, and the other one would respond to it? Or tell us about the process. Well, we began by really creating a plot line. So we created the plot line. We knew what was going to happen in the book. Uh, and then we simply wrote different chapters. Uh, so, so the work was really done separately, but we always sent them between us and made comments. So it was, it was not like we sat together and wrote. We wrote different chapters, sometimes just a part of a chapter. Yeah. So it was, a, it was a nice, friendly collaboration and, 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 uh, and structured in a way because we had an outline and we had the headings. But I in other respects, it was quite... Uh, free-flowing uh, project because you know Catherine would say that she would like to write maybe this chapter, this chapter, this chapter, and I had an interest in something else that was going on, and and it sort of worked worked out in the end, and and then we uh, did a lot of editing, both of us, to to make the text yeah. pretty much sound have have a single voice. I think that's important. So uh, so and when we read the book, I think we both experienced that when we read the book again during the editing process. There were like chapters or paragraphs that we couldn't really uh, remember who wrote uh, the first draft of because it's because it had gone, had gone back and forth. And but it was quite a popular sport for the Icelandic, you know, readers to actually try to guess who wrote what. And sometimes they were right. You know, I remember in, in one chapter, there's a mention of an Icelandic food, which is absolutely specifically Icelandic. None of you would have tasted it. It's like a, a cheese, a brown cheese, a little bit like, you know, Norwegian goat cheese. And nobody likes that in Iceland except me. So when one person was eating that in the book, my friend called me and said, I know you wrote that because nobody would mention that horrible cheese except you. But I so, think, I mean, yeah, I, I think Catherine also put in like political jokes that she would never get away with if she was writing her own book, but she knew I would get blamed for I those. just point to him. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, and that, that's an interesting point because th this novel is really, it's historical crime, but it's in two periods. And the first is 1956 when the, um, when Laura goes missing um, and maybe it may be darker. She may be the victim of a murder. Um, and then you sort of move us relatively quickly to 1986. And may maybe, do you want to explain just the basic bit of the plot? Because the book is just out now, and so you all may not have read it. Do you want to give that basic plot line? Yeah, so we start in 1956. There's this young, uh, like a teenage girl that has, has uh, spent the summer on, on the island of Vide uh, working for a, for a wealthy couple. And then she just doesn't return. She doesn't come home, and and her parents start looking for her, and, the, and no one knows if she left the island or not. So, uh, so she pretty much just disappears without a trace. And and for the purpose of the story, we imagine that this is a case that has been uh, the big case in Iceland from the 1950s to the 1980s. And every f uh, every few years, uh, journalists start digging up uh, the, the old clues, there were interviews with the police officers who were doing the investigation, nothing really new comes to light, until 30 years later when uh, when the story sort of starts properly, we have this young journalist and his sister, and he has uh, an idea to uh, try and create some new articles from the, from the case, not necessarily trying to solve it, but along the way he he stumbles upon a clue that uh, really puts the story in motion. 
And you could say because happily in Iceland we do not have many murders, uh, which might create a difficulty for a crime fiction writer. Um, so, but we have, you know, several cases of missing persons because we're surrounded by an ocean where several people have gone missing. We have very harsh nature where people go missing. So we have several true cases of people that have gone missing and you really don't know what happened. So, so that was also an inspiration for the story. And why um, 1986? What, what was happening culturally in Iceland in the mid 80s? Well, I think this idea that it would happen in 1986 was actually the reason that I said yes to Ragnar because it's so liberating not to write about your own time. And in 1986, both of us were 10 years old. Uh, it was a very remarkable time for Iceland because, for example, it was the year when Reagan and Gorbachev met in Reykjavik at Höfði Summit. Uh, so uh, it was, you know, Iceland was suddenly in the, you know, the center of the universe, really, at, in this year. But it was also a very eventful year for Iceland back home, you know, a lot of interesting, you know, developments happening in the city of Reykjavik, uh, so the things were happening. Yeah, it was, uh, I mean, we were building the first shopping mall in Reykjavik at that time, um, and in the, at the end of summer of 1986, Reykjavik was celebrating its 200th anniversary, and it was the biggest party you'd ever seen downtown, and that's where the book really starts, and it ends with, with, uh, with the Reagan Gorbachev Summit. And in between even, you know, it's just a few months, and in between we had the first private radio station being launched. Before that, there was only like two two channels from the from the government. And and the first uh, private television station as well, which was quite a breakthrough, because it had been one, one national television station only, and, and they didn't even uh, have any programming in July, because he was supposed to be on holiday. And, uh, and and not they did not have a program also on Thursdays. Yeah, and I really Thursdays. missed that time actually. You know, having no television, it's perfect. So Thursday nights she was supposed to be out at the symphony or the theater, so they just turned off TV. And so getting you know the the uh, the new television channel for a ten year old boy was like a dream come true. You could see a lot of American television and and whatever. And 1986 was the 200th anniversary of Reykjavik, right? Yeah, and we both remember that quite well because it was such a huge event. Um, and actually, it was the 200-year anniversary. I don't know if any of you have been to Iceland, uh, but it is indeed, you know, a very different thing from the city we are in now. So it was quite, uh, could you say, you know, it was quite a, you know, very monogamous society at that time. So it was like a huge party with a 200 meter cake downtown. And I remember personally being a kid and I really wanted a bite of that cake. So I kind of crawled under the grown ups to get that bite. And when I actually bit it, I felt it tasted of alcohol because it was sherry in the cake. <laughs> so I was a little bit disappointed. Yeah. And that, that comes through in the novel too. Um, so the editor of a newspaper in Reykjavik um, refers to a, a lot of this novel is set in the summer um, in 1986 and the editor of the newspaper refers to the summer as like the silly season what what does that mean uh, it basically means I mean on on a on a good week there's really nothing happening in Iceland but but in the summertime really there is nothing going on. So for a journalist to try and fill his paper with, with something in July, August is, is very hard. And that's really the trigger of you know, why they spend so much time investigating this old case because they have nothing else and they sort of try and sell, sell more papers by, by just reprinting old interviews and, and, and no one really thinks that they will actually you know, get on the right track to, to solve the case. And what about, um, there's this little fact in the novel that in 1986 in Iceland, you could, you could buy, you, you could get a shot of vodka at the bar, but not um, beer? What, it, why? <laughs> I think it was simply a relic from prohibition times. So actually, and when Icelanders used to drink, they drank always strong liquor. Uh, and beer was banned until 1989 in Iceland. It was allowed 
1989. So, so, so I think it was just an old relic of uh, times of prohibition and uh, ban of alcohol, and this kind of got left behind. Yeah. <laughs> so there's something, uh, you know, a, a plot twist in this novel, maybe not the only one, but I was about halfway through the novel, I was reading in my bed and I actually like sort of sat up because the, the plot just was, was so shocking. Um, and I'm not, you know, that's all I'm going to say about that. Um, but how, I guess, you know, did you two agree on that plot twist? Um, how did you decide to resolve it? Because once this plot twist happens, many other things have to happen right away. Well, this was decided from the beginning. Yeah, it was, uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's Very hard difficult to, to talk this. about yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> but it's something that uh, was a, a lot of fun to, to work with and and to build up uh, the the atmosphere and the, uh, you know, the sympathies for the characters um, until this part in them, you know, halfway through the story. And, 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 and since the book has been out like in Iceland before and now in the US, um, it's so nice to hear the reaction of people when they're reading the book because it's f uh, people get you know surprised or even angry and and if you uh, if you get those emotions from from readers then uh, then I I mean for an author that's uh, you, you appreciate that. Mm -hmm. But it's also we dedicate the book to Agatha Christie because she's about the only thing that we can agree upon <laughs> because we're both fans of Agatha Christie novels. So she was, of course, the master of surprise plots. So, so we really try to focus on, you know, this has to be a little bit in her spirit, you know. So, so we focused a little bit on the plot line, and and that was it. Makes it a little bit of a mystery, uh, in sort of, you know, reminding us of the golden age of crime fiction. And 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 setting a book in the eighties because I've done that before, uh, partly in some of my books. It is it is easier because you don't have any you don't have the you know the internet the GPS the DNA all sorts of stuff that sort of ruins crime fiction for uh, in modern times. I mean it's uh, you you can't really have like a golden age detective story set in current times because you uh, crimes are solved in a in a very different way now. It's very difficult to solve them you know in this psychological manner interviewing people in modern times because technology will usually give people away. And also, I mean, I think we managed in some way because there are two main characters. It's Valer, the journalist, and his sister. And and a journalist as a, as a main protagonist in a, in a detective story is not that uncommon, but his sister is Sunna. She is a, a student of literature. And so she is sort of like the amateur detective of the story. And that's also like a nod to the... Uh, to the golden age, that you have an amateur who is has nothing to do with the police, not a journalist, but somehow tries to figure out what has happened. Yeah. Well, in you know, in writer circles here, I, I often hear American writers talk about how much easier it is to set a novel before cell phone before smartphones were invented, because like you two can have a character waiting for a phone call, and while that character is waiting all this other stuff is happening that you can write about and involve the reader in, but but nowadays with social media and smartphones and communication so advanced, it is, I think, harder for a writer to to figure out the devi the sort of red herrings and the deviation. Well, I think it, it it's at least very different. And, you know, Icelandic crime fiction set in modern times, usually when you know, when the characters begin their investigation, they start by going to the social media of the victim and, and find everything about, you know, out of everything about the victim through his or her social media. So it's a very different affair. Um, and because we simply wanted it to make it a little bit like a classic mystery, you know, that was our idea. And then, and of course, for me as a politician, it was also very liberating to write about the 1980s and not having to kind of take a stand in contemporary issues, just be able to write about uh, the time of my childhood, really. Yeah, no, that must, it must have been really liberating. I mean, one of the, the sort of threads that runs through this novel is that in 1986 in Iceland, 
there was a big old, you know, old boys network who, you know, men who grew up together, they became the elites of the country. Being a politician, what what was it like for you, Katrine, to look back at that moment? I mean, did, did it make you thankful for the time you live in now or? Well, it's not a coincidence that this book is about gender-based violence because it's a girl gone missing. And it's not a coincidence that we read about the old boys network uh, because I'm a very strong feminist, so that's a, a strong part of my politics. Um, and I think, um, you know, it was not like we sat down and said, now we're going to write uh, a novel which shows the male chauvinist society of the 80s. It came quite naturally because we are, um, I think, very privileged to live in Iceland where actually these things have been debated uh, for many years. So, so, and where gender equality is actually uh, highest in the world. So, Ragnar, you're, you're on a sort of regular publishing schedule, but, you know, Katrine, you've been a critic and a scholar of Icelandic literature. So, sometimes it is hard for a critic to transition from that role of being a scholar and a critic to, to writing creatively, to writing fiction. Would, was that difficult for you? I mean, w was there sort of always a censor kind of in your the back of your head? Well, of course, there has some time passed since I was writing about literature, but yes, I must admit that I found it um, a little bit frightening to write fiction because I've written nonfiction, I've translated books, but I have not published my own fiction. So I was very stressed before, the, you know, as Ragnar can confirm, before the publication. I thought I thought everybody would hate it. Mm -hmm. I think we're just lucky that the book was published because she was every step of the way she was like, no, let's not do it. Let's not publish it. Just keep it here. Yeah, we actually, our librarians, we had a little display um, for Katrina and Ragnar uh, back here. Um, of items related to Iceland and crime fiction. And um, we, our librarians, thank you, librarians, found her book about Icelandic literature. And I think, um, is it out of print in it's Iceland? out of print, yes. Yeah. Okay, well, we have it here at the Library of Congress. So. <laughs> um, in Icelandic. Yeah. So I am curious to see if you all have thoughts about why Scandinavian noir ha has really captured the global imagination. I mean, people all over the globe are reading mysteries and thrillers set in Iceland, Norway, Finland. What, do you have thoughts about that? Uh, I think it something to, has something to do with uh, the uh, the impression that the Scandinavian countries are very peaceful, which they in a way are, and I think people enjoy seeing that they really may not be as perfect as you think. Mm -hmm. And uh, you have this image of like this pristine snow. Everything is is, is, uh, is so beautiful, but when you you know put some blood on the snow, it everything shatters. And I think that's what, what Scandinavian noir does. And uh, yeah, it shows these, these societies uh, in a different light. Um, I think Ragnar is describing what Sjövalo Wall and Valle, the Swedish couple, described. You know, their crime fiction was about the dark sellers in the Scandinavian welfare society. So, so that is absolutely a threat. Uh, but also, I think uh, what defines uh, the Nordic noir tradition is a great focus on environment. And you will see that also in our book on the weather and the environment. And for especially Icelandic crime fiction, nature and environment is also always very prominent, really. And I think actually this is something, maybe because you know we are surrounded by harsh nature, the weather can be uh, terrible often. <laughs> so, so I think it's uh, I think it's part as uh, you know a very strong part of our identity. So I think that is also something that kind of defines the Nordic noir. Do you, um, I mean, you both decided to dedicate the book to Agatha Christie, so maybe this, the answer to this question is evident, but c can you both name your favorite crime writer? Uh, I mean, obviously I would say Agatha Christie, mm. but uh, but if, if, if we can name a few, I mean, I'd like to say P.T. James as well. 
who wrote about Dal Glitch in, in the UK. And then I love, you know, I love the American uh, uh, Golden Age authors like Ellery Queen and S.S. Van Dyne. Um, especially when you're traveling here in, in, in the States, it's nice to read those those books. Mm-hmm. Well, Agatha Christie, obviously, because uh, she was the first proper crime fiction writer I read, and I, I absolutely became fascinated after reading The Murder on the Orient Express. But I'm also a great fan of Henning Mankiel. Uh, I thought his well under books were absolutely great. And I must mention Stieg Larsson. And when his first book came out, uh, was published, it was like really being, you know, punched in the face. And it's interesting. I think it was called The Girl with a Dragon Tattoo in yes. English translation. But the original title was actually Men Who Hate Women. Oh. And it was considered too radical, I think. But I thought it was, but the book was really a punch in the face. And I thought mm. it was something extraordinary. Yeah. Another um, Scandinavian crime novel that, you know, has two times in which which is told the time when the crime happens, and then the, the later investigation. So, last question for me. So, you all um, start thinking of your questions, and we'll get someone to come around with a mic. Um, is there going to be another co-written novel yeah. by you? Three? I, no, I'll take that no, one. no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think we the were next trying to be that. <laughs> <laughs> I think the next one must because you said you know we discussed the. Uh, 1989, when the beer was allowed, I think that would be a fantastic. Uh, Ragnar keeps pushing. You know, you the, know. I must tell you one. a secret that he's. You know, this book pr- would probably never have been written except that he's a very passive, aggressive person, and now he keeps pushing for the next ones. <laughs> it sounds more aggressive, actually. Yeah, you could start that novel with a great night, like the first night that beer is available in Iceland, and someone kills someone else, and you know. Um, so. Anybody have some questions for us? We've got the mic there in the back, so. Okay, Danielle, can you come way up here at the front? Um, I guess it's sort of two part, but you, a lot of your audience is all over the world, and I was wondering, first, when you write, are you conscious of the fact that you're that your audience is going to be people who live outside of Iceland, and, and if you in any way adjust for that fact. And secondly, you both obviously have totally mastered English, so what's it like to work with a translator and see how they change your words for us? Well, if, you know, because Ragnar has obviously more experience, but, you know, this book at least from my part, was just written for Icelandic readers. Uh, so so I never actually, I didn't think it would be published and definitely did not think it would be published outside of Iceland. So so that is, you know, quite interesting. But, but I think actually the translator did an amazing job. Uh, she's extremely good. And, and um, of course, some nuances had to be explained, some specifically Icelandic nuances, but uh, I think she did a great job. The brown cheese. The brown cheese. Yeah, the brown cheese first. Uh, yeah, I mean, I agree. I mean, I, uh, every time I write a book, it's it's uh, I I try to write it for the local audience because I think that makes it you know genuine as as well for the for the international readers. Because if you buy an Icelandic book, you you sort of want it to be really Icelandic. So I think you can cheat your way out of that. And um, and the translator. I mean, we have Victoria is a, is a fantastic translator and and. It was a it was a lovely collaboration as always, but we I mean work closely with her and to make sure this this works out and and also I mean because there are not many Icelandic translators in you know not in all not all countries are so lucky you know as as the US the UK to have good or to have even any translators from from Icelandic so so across the world a lot of jurisdictions uh, territories would do the translation from English. So we we sort of really have to make sure that the uh, English translation is is something we're very happy with. Who else has a question? As a prime minister, we know your schedule must be very busy. Can you give us an insight how you made the time to write this beautiful novel? Well, as I said, you know, most of it was written during a pandemic and 
as a politician, I'm always traveling around, uh, going to the UN General Assembly where I was yesterday, <laughs> and uh, traveling around Iceland, meeting people, and all of that obviously was not happening during the pandemic. Uh, it's a sad fact, but I don't really have any hobbies, so I just read a lot, and and somehow I thought I'm going to go crazy. So actually, for me, this was. Uh, I think, you know, I think it's fair to say that I think this project saved my mental health during COVID because I was absolutely consumed, you know, always thinking about the pandemic and what we were going to do next. So it was actually great to have something else to think about in the evenings. Are you able as as prime minister to um, like go to book parties and literary parties with other writers in, in Reykjavik or elsewhere in Iceland? Or? We did not do a lot of that, we must admit. You know, I think we went to three places, you know, before last Christmas because there was no time. So, um, yeah, I mean, when, when, when she uh, agreed to do the book, she said, you know, I will not have any time to promote it. And I thought, you know, of course you'll have time. Uh, everyone has a little bit of free time, but uh, I mean, again. honestly... Honestly, she, I mean, it, she's the busiest person I have ever known. And uh, so uh, so it's really hard to, to promote the book, but it's a lot of fun when we get an opportunity. But I think, it. you know, to write a book is really fun. I really enjoy that. But to promote a book, that's not as much fun. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the writing is the best bit of it. Yeah, absolutely. So I totally understand writers who you never see in festivals or anywhere. You know, now I totally connect to them. Yeah, because Ragnar, you have a, a book festival in Reykjavik that you started, right? Um, Iceland Noir? Yeah, <coughs> it's been around for like for 10 years now. So we're doing the, the we're doing that in mid-November and it's always growing and uh, this year we have uh, Dan Brown coming and Neil Gaiman, Louis Penny is coming and, and Hillary Clinton. So, uh, so it's always growing and, and it's like a hobby for me and my friend Irsa, who is an Icelandic crime author, to to chair this festival. And it takes up a lot of time, but it's always worth it when, when, when it starts. You're all invited. Okay, who has the next question? Please. Okay, back here in the back. Um, could you talk a little bit about the tradition of um, giving people a book and chocolates in Iceland? Is that right? Do I have that right? What, can you repeat your question, please? Um, yes, the book plot. The Are the you talking about the books for Christmas? Books for Christmas. I think that's it. <clears throat> and and reading. I mean, that is absolutely true. I mean, the all almost all books in Icelandic are uh, published in October, November, as as uh, you know, as a part of this Christmas book plot, and they are published in hardback, uh, so they make for great Christmas gifts, and. I think it's safe to say that most or almost every Icelander would get a book for Christmas as a present. And there is a very strong tradition that people would read. I mean, we open our presents on Christmas Eve. That's the big day for us. And so when everything is settled down uh, on Christmas Eve, I would think a, l a lot of people or, you know, maybe most of most of us would sit down and read a new book into the night and with a box of chocolates. Absolutely. A nice tradition. Um, okay, who, we, okay, right here. As you mentioned, many of the Scandinavian countries, to include Iceland, haven't had to deal with a lot of violent crime. So, when you're gathering inspiration for your crime novel, do you look at headline articles? Surely, you don't just sit around at night and imagine the worst. Well, um, I think you know. Maybe, you know, I think actually people in Iceland, they really enjoy crime fiction, maybe exactly because they don't have to deal with crime in everyday lives. So therefore, they really enjoy crime. So when you talk about inspiration, I think um, I mentioned earlier that Iceland just began, you know, translating foreign crime fiction as soon as, you know, when Sherlock Holmes was published in English, it was translated to Iceland like only a few years later. So we have been reading foreign crime fiction really from the start of the genre. It's always been extremely popular. And uh, I think probably the inspiration comes from that, obviously, just we are writing within a genre. And then this fact of uh, that we have this history of missing persons. And I think 
uh, when people go missing, it's very difficult because you never will know their fate. Uh, and that's the case here in this story. You know, nobody knows the fate of Laura. And, and so there, I think the inspiration also comes from this fate of many Icelandic people throughout the decades and centuries. And, and um, I mean, the literal inspiration for this story simply came from a photo that I saw a couple of, uh, maybe three or four years ago, of of the island. That uh, So in the island there is this old house, and on the wall there is a photo of the island from the 1950s. And it's like, it's somewhat sort of a romantic image of the way the island used to be, where the, when there were more houses, uh, you know, maybe someone actually living there, which no, no one does anymore. So just seeing this photo, it, it stuck with me. And, and then when we met, and I you know, I pitched this idea that we should do a story that was set on the island uh, with a missing girl that basically came from a, you know, a very peaceful photograph. So, so the, it can come from anywhere. Back, okay. Go on, Diane, Katrin Ragnar. Uh, my question is, what made you decide on the title uh, Reykjavik? That's so funny, <laughs> because it was a working title, actually. Um, and it was, you know, we we decided to, you know, decide the title later. So it was the working title. But when we had finished the script, we actually thought that the city of Reykjavik had become like a character in the book, because uh, we really tried to describe the city. And, and I think if you read the book, you will feel that we love the city. So in the end, you know, we said, okay, what, what shall we call it? And we simply thought that the working title was the most descriptive one. And also, I mean, I think we were secretly hoping that people would, uh, would were looking for like guidebooks on Reykjavik and would uh, buy our book <laughs> by mistake. Um, we, we don't blame you for that. Okay, I think we have a question in the back, maybe? Okay, okay. And you have one? Oh, no, we've got one. Do you have a question? Uh, Prime Minister, your f obvious fascination with crime and crime fiction, do you think it has any impact at all on your criminal justice policy? No, but I think the politics might influence the writing. <laughs> so I think it, 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 the politics are rather, you know, influencing the writing, but not the crime fiction, my politics. I hope not. <laughs> Actually, um, I can tell them the story about the skull, right? Because because um, just a week ago or two weeks ago, during a renovation at the prime minister's office in Reykjavik, and some floorboards were taken up. They found two bones from a human skull. So that created quite a sensation in Iceland. Um, and obviously those were old bones, so now they're being analyzed, so we will find out more. But uh, on the same day I got a message, well, this minister hasn't been seen for some time. <laughs> so, so let's say that people in Iceland connect very much uh, together my politics and my crime fiction. And just to say, I mean, this skull in her office will be in the next book. Uh, well, <laughs> which will not be written. But <laughs> No, between the between the beer in 1989 and those bones, like you've you've definitely got a novel there. So, more questions? Okay, here in the front. Oh. Okay. Okay. Okay, let me repeat that in case everybody didn't hear. She's a huge fan of the Hidden Iceland series, and when will number four in the series be translated into English? <coughs> and will there okay. be more? Yeah. Give out the plan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so the original series of, of Hulda, the Hidden Iceland series, is a trilogy, where which is uh, the main character, and it's told backwards in time, basically. And so, uh, so what I did after that is. Uh, uh, and that, you know, in the first book, for those who haven't read it, it Hulda is this police police woman who uh, uh, who is asked to leave her job uh, before she's supposed to retire. And when I, once I'd finished these three books, uh, I thought, you know, 
because when you read those books, you you sort of hate the guy who's taking over from her, taking her office, this young up and coming policeman. So I thought maybe I'll do a book about him, and that's like a sort of a, a spin off from the Hilda series. <coughs> and I think that's the fourth book you're, book you're referring to, and that is, uh, and uh, that will be another trilogy basically. So it will be two separate trilogies, and and Hilda will feature in in both of them. Uh, and so the first one in that series, I think, I, I think it's out next year. I mean, I think it's the next one up in English. Yeah. Okay. So um, they are going to go directly here from, I mean, from here to Dulles. They have to fly back to Reykjavik. So I'm going to ask you all to um, stay seated, and they're going to leave us. But we did ask them to sign. Um, book plates and uh, they, the books and the book plates are for sale back in the back of the room. So let's, um, they came here from the United Nations. Let's thank them for coming to Washington. To do it. Thank you.